Well, good evening, everyone. It's seven o'clock. Shall we get started? Might be a good idea. I'd like to welcome everyone here. We have some invited guests this evening. Karen Braun from the Gawler Business Development Group. Welcome. Um, do we have Anne Maroney here? I can't see Anne. David, is Anne coming or somebody? Yes, she is supposed to be connecting in. She just hasn't joined yet. Okay. All right. And, and did have a prior engagement with Adelaide Plains that ran right into this one, so. Oh, there we go. There are to come in, so that must be Anne now, or somebody from RDA. There you are. Lovely. Hi, Anne. We've, we're just about, we're, we're going to start the workshop, Anne, so you've come in perfect timing. Welcome, Anne Maroney, CEO of RDA um, Barossa, Gawla, Light and Adelaide Plains. Um, so I'd like to welcome everyone here this evening. This is a workshop. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge uh, that we meet, we meet on the traditional lands of the Ghana people this evening and we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. It's particularly poignant at the moment with it being Reconciliation Week. And tomorrow is the anniversary of the Mabo decision in 1992, uh, which is quite significant. And that's why uh, Reconciliation Week finishes on that particular date. Um, we also acknowledge the Ghana people as the custodians of the Greater Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the people today. Don't know who else that was. Trevor Taylor. Trevor's joining us. Trevor from RDA Barossa as well. Okay. Just some housekeeping rules about workshops. These are workshops, as we know, are uh, informal gatherings. They're not for the purpose of debating issues and coming to a deliberative uh, position or making decisions effectively. They are for the purpose of uh, uh, information sharing, uh, which is a really important role of workshops. And so under the Local Government Act, we are allowed to gather and have um, these types of sessions. Uh, this is a public workshop. We do have some invited guests who will be presenting tonight. And I thank them for coming along. Uh, members of the community are Welcome to listen, and I welcome everyone who might be watching on YouTube this evening. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, yes, there's no set agenda, there's no minutes. Um, if I'd ask everyone to turn their phones to silent, please, in case so that it doesn't disrupt our um, doesn't disrupt our our session. And if you um, and we usually have our uh, mics off anyway, so it shouldn't be a major drama for the way we're doing it via Zoom. So the purpose of tonight's workshop is twofold. Firstly, it will provide opportunity uh, for a COVID-19 initial response and recovery plan overview, and that is the nature of some of the presentations this evening. And these presentations, uh, as I said, are from the Gawler Business Development Group and, of course, RDA, Barossa, Gawler, Light, Adelaide Plains, and, of course, council staff will also be providing some information. Uh, the presentations will detail what each organisation has done as an initial response to the pandemic and what each plans to deliver during the upcoming recovery phase, which is often a much longer, a longer phase. There will be opportunities for open discussion with all of us uh, after these presentations. Um, secondly, uh, the, focus, the workshop will also touch on the development of the Gawler Economic Development Strategy, which of course, as we know, we deferred uh, as we came into this pandemic, and I think that was a, a good decision by Council. Um, an opportunity is provided this evening to further discuss this strategy and some of the draft pillars, incorporation of COVID-19 response potentially, or with a you know, discussion around that and strategies to support local and regional economic uh, recovery. With, in regard to the strategy, the economic development strategy, that will uh, ultimately uh, be revised by staff and then that will come back for a further discussion at a full council meeting in the near future. 
Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand over to David Barrett. Um, David, you're gonna take his shop uh, and um, yeah, hopefully everybody enjoys uh, tonight's workshop. Thank you. Oh, and welcome Trevor as well. Thanks, Karen. Uh, I'll take the opportunity, first of all, just to go to Henry. He'd like to uh, make a few opening comments. So, Henry. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Karen, and thanks, David. Uh, yeah, further to Karen's opening remarks, um, just for the clarity um, and, and a little bit of context, members, um, since the crisis uh, was triggered and Council's resolution, um, few weeks beforehand to defer consideration of uh, the economic development strategy. Um, I convened a, a series of meetings with, with um, the Gold Business Development Group, um, the, uh, the, the RDA and Andrew Morris from the Innovation Hub, uh, further to council staff, uh, particularly David and Kirsty, such that we could start to draw together all of our collective thinking and efforts on Firstly, where we were at with the Gawler Wrap, which in the first couple of meetings was a particular focus, but then it, it, it certainly expanded to, okay, council has commissioned this work in formulating the economic development strategy. We now have this crisis with the various layers of resources that we have at our disposal um, with, with all of these groups. Um, we need to make sure that um, we can articulate and work together on the immediate response and then working on the strategy moving forward. So, um, uh, and we've been meeting uh, via Zoom for about four or five weeks and more recently, uh, specifically talking about the economic development strategy leading up to the preparation of, of this workshop. Um, so I'd, I'd like to take the opportunity just to say thank you to the School of Business Development Group and the RDA uh, and, and Andrew Morris who unfortunately won't be joining us because he's he's ill um but uh yeah i um, look forward to the conversation so thank you back to you david thanks henry um so in front of us we have the rough format of tonight's workshop so presentations by each of the uh, parties listed uh, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions uh, at the end of each of the presentations from the individual parties and then another opportunity once the uh, town of Gawler's uh, presentation is finished uh, if there's any further questions in wrapping up uh, and then we'll move to the second part of the workshop on the economic development strategy and Kirsty will lead us through some questions around uh, that when we get to that uh, point in time. So first cap off the rank, I'll be handing over to Karen Braum from the Gawler Business Development Group and bear with us um, for slide changes, those people presenting, you're gonna have to tell me when to click to the next slide because you don't have control. So just note that I have the control. So uh, just let me know when we wanna move to the next slide. Thanks, over to you, Karen. That's better, didn't want to unmute. unmute. Uh, thanks, David. Um, so the Gawler Business Development Group obviously has been extremely busy and the board have uh, made lots of commitments and met on quite a number of occasions at special general meetings to make sure that we can put together our responses to this crisis. So firstly, the initial response, the initial priority for Gawler Business Development Group was to determine the operational status of Gawler businesses identify any areas in which they may need assistance, and to ensure all information provided by the state and federal governments, SAPOL and health authorities was disseminated as soon as we received it. During the first week of restrictions being imposed, the number of businesses severely impacted became quite obvious, which clearly demonstrated to us that this was going to be widespread and ongoing. The immediate restrictions resulted in approximately 350 Gawler people, or well, local people, being stood down, put off, or having their hours significantly reduced. The information gathered enabled us to plan how we should approach the provision of ongoing support to businesses. A special general meeting was called, and the board canceled all events for the remainder of 2020 and reallocated $20,000 into COVID-19 response and recovery projects, with all other remaining funds carried over into the 2021 financial year to continue the recovery projects into the future. So connecting, 
Um, cold calling to businesses to provide more targeted crisis management advice and support commenced almost immediately. This required a good deal of empathy, tact, guidance and planning to assist businesses to work through the current pandemic with a view to coming out the other side with a viable business and healthy mindsets. Continual liaisons with key stakeholders, government, health authorities, business associates and others has ensured that we were providing a relevant and accurate COVID-19 information to the business community from the first day that resources started to become available to us. Cold calling determined referrals required for our members and to receive relevant guidance from specialists and business advisors who have current knowledge of specific legal, accounting, leasing and HR issues and remedies and with the GBDG paying all of those costs. Advisors were sourced via the RDA's B2B program, thank you RDA, and a panel of GBDG source providers on top of that. The total number of assists and engagements to date from the 30th of March to today is 695. Now, assists and engagements isn't individual businesses, of course, that is repeat sessions or repeat um, conversations with people to make sure that we were getting through to them the information and the advice that they needed. And over 30 business referrals for specialised advice and some of which are still ongoing and will be for some time. In addition to providing advice and support to our businesses, there was an obvious gap in their ability to continue to market their products and services due to reduced or ceased income. Therefore, as there was a, also a low engagement rate from businesses to register for the Gawler Community app, the board decided that it would be beneficial to provide our businesses with an additional platform to showcase their offerings and that it would not only benefit the business community, but also assist the town of Gawler to grow the engagement rate for the app. GBDG is offering members a six month trial on the Gawler Community app paid for again by the GBDG. And obviously this is all in addition to the range of marketing opportunities already provided to our members. 16 businesses have applied to go onto the app and to date eight of those have been fully onboarded. So providing, what are we providing for the businesses right now? We're providing a peer discussion group, which is called Tammy's Table. And that's once a month for members to discuss current business issues, concerns, triumphs, successes, this group has proven to be a valuable platform for those that are engaged. And immediately after each of the sessions, it's interesting to see businesses that are implementing practical elements into their businesses that have been discussed during the session. We currently have two groups running with eight participants in each group. We're providing a crisis management profit surge program to all Gola businesses. This commenced mid-March and it's progressing really well with approximately 23 Gawler slash Barossa businesses that engaged in the program. And it's about 80% of the way through now. So that's going extremely well. Showcasing Gawler, we had 10 weeks of airing the Gawler television advertisement produced with Andrew Costello from South Aussie with Fozzy. That started uh, the second to last week of March and finished last weekend. So that was really beneficial. We're providing a range of webinars that are designed to assist businesses to work through the pandemic and plan for a strong recovery. And so far we've either delivered or shared um, links to 20 webinars. GBDG has engaged BIE Creative for a three month period to add marketing tools and resources to our current strategy that are designed to provide more targeted marketing for our members. We've developed and rolled out a variety of different content. Um, I think, sorry, I think we were, oh, you've changed it. Well done, David. <laughs> Um, where was I up to? Yeah, we've developed and rolled out a variety of different content across various platforms to test and measure what works and what doesn't work with key audiences. We've been concentrating on getting quality content across the platforms so that as we invite more people to like those pages, they're seeing a terrific vibrant content and want to delve deeper to discover more. This will have a direct impact on the visibility of businesses and increase engagement and then also profits. We've introduced Sambo on Saturday. It's Brian Samble interviewing various business owners from around Gawla in a podcast style environment. And that has been really successful. And I think to date we have uh, 
bank of, I think, six interviews that have been done. We have Meet the Local Businesses, which has only started last week, and we engage Leanne Stovall, and she's the owner of Pole for Fitness down in Gawler, and she's the interviewer. She's a, a younger, really bubbly female, and we thought, well, that might be a nice alternative to Brian chatting with some of the slightly older people there, Brian. <laughs> and it's been brilliant. If anyone has seen those interviews, well, we've only shown one so far because we, uh, I think we filmed 10. I think it was 10 last week. That's going down really well and she's doing a, a fantastic job. So that's really good. Um, we've done short grabs on who are the GBDG. So short video grabs from each of the Gold Business Development Group board members to again create some more visibility so that not only the business owners in the region but also the, um, the residents in the region know who the business development group are and can approach them when they need some assistance. A free plug Friday where businesses can send us a video, a very short video of their own to promote their business on a Friday morning. So all of these um, activities are uploaded to Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, our website and LinkedIn. And we believe that by including more local people in these videos, we'll bring further eyes, not only to the social media pages, but also eyes on Gawla, new eyes on Gawla. It's businesses and everything the region has to offer. We've created a multifaceted marketing approach and early insights show that we are having a very positive impact. So next on to recovery. In addition to everything that I've just quickly gone over for uh, with you is the GBDG is planning for recovery. And this is the, probably the most critical phase after helping businesses stay um, operational or at least not completely closing during the first phase. This phase of the, um, the pandemic and the need for businesses to implement new practices into their operations, upskilling of staff, rebuilding of all aspects of their business, and providing opportunities for businesses to enter into the digital world and plan for any further crisis that may impact their business again in the future. To assist businesses to recover as quickly as possible, we're providing additional marketing opportunities, brand awareness assistance, financial guidance and business planning, because these are the things that will actually help them stay viable in the future. We've been in discussions with the Town of Gawler, RDA Barossa, BIE Creative, the Light Electric Community Recovery Committee, the Regional Business Alliance, the Office of the Small Business Commissioner, Gawler Business Innovation Hub, and local business owners to ensure every aspect of business recovery is included. Collaborations between the Gawler Business Development Group, the Town of Gawler, and the Business Innovation Hub is absolutely critical to ensure businesses can emerge from this current period with some confidence, with support and a clear path forward to realise the economic revival of the Gawler region. Still to come, as well as this, um, the second part of the recovery phase, we'll do second stage business reviews. We've done the first stage and we'll do a second stage, followed by further targeted support and development if required and in numerous areas. So we anticipate there'll be areas, um, assistance needed in areas such as encouraging businesses to improve their digital presence, providing staff development, increasing their, their business management skills, reviewing their business and implementing strategies to build a stronger foundation for the business to grow from, self-help webinars, such as how to market your business effectively for little expense because they're not going to have a lot of cash flow for quite some months, creating and implementing business plans, marketing plans, and business continuity planning. We've got webinars coming up on zero. In fact, the first zero webinar was today. Zero, a mile, deconstructing your business, the five levels of customer experience, pushing through difficult times, Facebook advertising, knowing your numbers, critical element of business and email marketing. So the recovery projects will be continually reviewed to ensure that what we are providing is hitting the target and relevant for that particular point in time for the recovery phase. And that's about it. <laughs> Thanks very much, Karen. Uh, any questions from elected members for Karen before we move to Anne from the RDA? No, lovely. Thanks very much, Karen. So over to you, Anne. I'll just move to your slide. Yes. 
Thank you. I think elected members have um, seen the framework for our uh, regional economic development strategy, but I start with this because it helps explain the transitions we're going through now. Ultimately, RDA's focus is more on its regional connectedness, making sense of what the region-wide opportunities are and trying to um, get traction on projects that are either, they can be small, but are particularly strategic from a region-wide perspective or do involve all elements of the region. I can talk more about some examples a bit later. In all this though, the fundamentals remain really important. The fundamentals of place, of people, of business prosperity and um, delivering an element of business competitiveness that sees business stay in action, continue to employ people. And together all these things create the opportunity and the, if you like, the hook for people to expand their businesses, to grow their businesses, to want to invest here and create new industries here. If we don't get those fundamentals right, um, it's just not, we just can't compete in the world of investment and diversity of economy. Um, the, the governance layer there um, does include government, of course, including local government, but it's more about how decisions are made, how information's shared. It's more about networks and making sure the right people are at the table when decisions about the future are made. And that can be all kinds of decisions. The things that give government social license, I suppose, to operate is what's incorporated in good governance. The regional competitive advantage is what grows if we get all these things right, that our uh, proposition for new investment, for new talent to move here, for people to want to live here is really around that regional competitive advantage. And that makes the next bit easy, that diversity in investment um, in income and skills and you know, really quality jobs around the region. So that regional competitive advantage is kind of where our main focus will end up being. David? Thank you. So come the crisis. <laughs> All that work is still uh, live, but a lot of resources were in fact diverted to that crisis response, which gets back to the business competitiveness ultimately you know, what, what's happening with businesses? Um, um, what are those crisis support mechanisms? And we focused on HR management. You know, what do I do if I can't employ my staff? How do I get it right that I'm not in trouble? How do I access the benefits? What does cash, what, what cash flow means in the future? And that does include some assessment of whether they met the guidelines for JobKeeper. Digital tech clearly an opportunity, um, and Karen's referred to this too, that in a, in a closed down world, connecting with your customers and finding ways to do business online became critical, but that's an opportunity, that's an investment into the future. And of course, up to date on government support and having someone who could answer questions on what that looked like. Um, We've been promoting platforms, including the Gawler app, and Trevor's had a, I think Trevor's stats show that a lot of our business support has been focused, probably pretty equally between Barossa and Gawler, where the majority of businesses are, but certainly a lot of referrals from Karen um, in terms of that specialist support. So the stats Trevor's got are not just, it's not our only business contacts, as Karen pointed out, they're deep dives, and there are those initial connections to make sure business is doing okay and identify if they need a deep dive. Trevor, if you're there, do you want to cut in now for a minute or two and really briefly and talk about those stats? Yes, just quickly. I mean, um, directly, and when we talk direct, it's not just talking over the phone. It's actually consulting directly with the business owners. We've had 32 direct companies that we've supported. Um, and we've supported, you know, Gawler Business Development Group very closely. Uh, Karen and I have been working on a number of businesses to support. Um, you know, just to let um, everyone know, we've got a, around about 11 direct consultants that actually live and work in the Gawler area from Robert Milanese, Jess Giles, Peter Cady, Stephen Arthur, 
Henry Muller, Johannes Zanek, uh, Justin McDonald, Jess McEwen, Darren Scragg, Sherry Chambers, Sue Edwards, and basically Rudal and Rudal lawyers. They're all B2B consultants. Um, to let everyone know, the major issues, and there's a lot of stress and anxiety out there, so we have to be show a lot of empathy, and we're dealing with a lot of sensitive issues. The main issues have been marketing, moving very quickly into the digital, e-commerce, and online platforms. A lot of businesses through COVID-19 were caught with their pants down by their ankles. They didn't have an e-commerce or digital strategy, and they had to move quickly out of the brick and mortar to e-commerce. Um, the second thing is we had accountants and bookkeepers working extremely close with a lot of business owners, helping them with the stimulus economic packages and actually getting JobKeeper funds, getting the 10,000 emergency grant. Um, these were very important. So um, from there, we also put together a number of webinars because all our networks fell down. We weren't able to do business to business breakfasts anymore. So from March to now, we've got seven webinars that we've put together to connect with the community and assist business owners. And it was from social media, Q&A webinar with Melanie's accountants on the stimulus packages, innovating marketing strategies, um, the myriad of legal issues, and then also online sales. And we also got another human resource one coming up um, currently. Um, you know, the fire isn't out in Gawler. Um, Karen and I are dealing with a, a lot of sensitive issues between landlords and tenants. And um, Anne knows a couple of, um, you know, examples that we are working with where sometimes, you know, the consultation isn't working that well. Um, so we still got, a, a, you know, a far way to go through this COVID-19 and help business owners. But yeah, between the 40 consultants we've got and, biz and call a business, we're working very closely to try and overcome a number of issues in the town. Thanks, Trevor. Um, we can go to the next slide. I've mentioned the jobs matching there, which has been really successful. And, uh, and a point Trevor made about some of those issues about leases, landlords, banks, not quite coming to the party. Um, we've been able to elevate through Minister Marino at a, at a uh, federal level. I had a call today from one of the government liaison people from um, a major bank asking for more details about the local issue that we had raised with the minister and they're going to see if they can resolve it. So, you know, the system is working in small ways. As Trevor said, things aren't cured yet, but, but things are working. So, well, uh, as I said, we applied resources to the response, but the recovery has been in mind since about week two. So we're back to our strategy, which is consistent. And we've just really sharpened our focus on what the recovery priorities are. So both in terms of institution, institutional and strategic. So looking at water, brand and connection, food, wine, tourism, value chains, clusters and townships and pace. And then the recovery capital projects, which water around investment and water, there's more detail on the next slide, too much detail on the next slide. Um, investment in brand and connection, investment in food, wine, value chains, clusters and investments in townships and place. All recovery projects we're working with, but that was what we were uh, proposing. So this you will receive a copy of to look at at your leisure. But it does just give a bit more detail as to what that um, headline strategy on the slide before starts to look like. The, the main thing here is the sharp focus on water and water related projects and food and wine value chains. So, you know, that's a supply chain, just broader, and includes the, the secondary suppliers, many of which would be in Gawler, including services and um, and other sorts of supplies that, that go into those food and wine value chains around the region. Brand destination and development, including townships. There are double, triple, probably quadruple benefits to focusing on township development at the moment. There's a whole, there's a whole wellbeing thing for the community. But again, it's critically important to attracting investment, amenity, is, is one of the drivers of investment in many ways. One, you want to invest in a town that looks vibrant and prosperous. But secondly, if people are going to um, build their business here and they want 
they want to attract the right kind of workers, talent, and want their family to live here, then you've got to have the kind of um, amenity that they want. So this is indeed a partnership um, priority where brand and destination development are very much in the focus of local government too. But looking at how we build this, tell stories and differentiate and use the resources from across the wider region to build this in each individual town and centre um, becomes really important. And if there is a big change with COVID, apart from that, as what does the Prime Minister say, laser-like focus on the uh, priorities, is to probably for RDA play a bit more of a role in the people and place level to try and build that brand destination and development to help make our industries more competitive. And in that vein, I'm really, really stuck, and we can talk about it later in this session, on Gawler's um, identity as a smart living community, one that's not only a gig city, um, but that has smart living for its community. It's green, it's sustainable, it's connected, it's networked, it's, it's physically attractive, it's got the right facilities. That builds a really you know, smart community and smart living, which can be a core brand for Gawler. And that will do me for the moment. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anne. Any questions of Anne? Yes, Karen. When you ask a question, David, remind them to unmute. <laughs> yeah, I, I just did. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just moving okay. across the screen, so I'm just finding my cursor. So that was my fault. Um, yeah, if, David, uh, Anne, thank you for that. And thank you, Karen. I'm just looking at this RDA recovery slide that's up on the screen. Yep. And um, I've not seen that before. Uh, I don't think the elected members, have we seen that before? This is the first time we've seen that? It's, in a, it's a work, it, yes, it is. It's a work in progress. And mm -hmm. this is the point of presenting it tonight. I mean, that, oh, the, the, the triangle framing is what you've seen before. Um, I think I've... Yeah, I've been using that framing of how we develop our strategy or the so, py pyramid, the hierarchy of needs. Yeah. My question is, um, I've, I've, I noticed a little bit about Gawler, but not a lot. And yeah. I'd just like to, because flood, flooding is a huge issue. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, that's, I'm really glad you mentioned that, Karen, because when I sent this and I was looking at it today, I realised that probably in my desire in my fiddling around to fit things on the one screen under recovery capital projects economic diversity there's a second project sits there which i have reinstated but i didn't want to mess up the cart by sending an updated slide in today and it's got the gawler river floodplain management um, infrastructure projects is there so you're quite right to bring that up but it is on the plan it was just i don't know how it fell off sometimes you of so space who, bar at the wrong time. Who from Gawler has fed into this slide? Um, uh, Henry through the, uh, well, when I say Henry's fed into it, I've brought in the information that we've had working with people. We did um, receive some updates of Gawler priority projects. But I should point out, Karen, that many things here uh, umbrella, so livable communities, development, new growth centres, health facilities and education facilities with regionally uh, connected, should be with regional industry curriculum pathways. Motel student accommodation, uh, Gawler's there specifically mentioned, but art trails include Gawler. A lot of these, uh, there's a, a couple of specific headline projects, but um, hero centres, um, arts and cultural facilities, innovation hubs, um, things like this have projects in them across the whole region. In my um, ambition to create you know, a grasp but at a glance about the kind of projects that are going on, there isn't room to put sufficient detail for each project. And I will say fairly, when Henry saw this, he raised exactly the same question with me and I gave the same answer. So there's a lot of detail work that sits 
behind this with different projects. This is by no means our submission to government on capital on um, shovel ready projects. That's being built as we go. And we do have submissions from, from the town of Gawler administration on oh. what could be in and what could be out of our shovel ready projects list. Right, okay. Yeah, oh. so, sorry, I should have mentioned that. I was just being mindful of time, but um, I'm happy to, to further expand if we end up with time as to what projects are under those umbrella headings. But I started to itemise individual projects across the four council areas and industry. And you can imagine that's, um, if, if you get down to that level of detail, you've got to have them all in. And then that just becomes impossible, impossible to see it from a strategic point of view. We, we have got priority projects that council has. Yep. Got, and that's been well documented. Yeah. My, my view, and I do talk to a lot of ministers just as you do, and, um, you know, they, they don't want 30 or 40 projects. They want, you know, they want a handful of projects across the region that they can really get their teeth into. And they want to know, they want to know jobs. And I, I know you know all the stuff, but when I yeah. see the slide, um, I do get concerned that, you know, Gawler isn't well represented, Anne. And well, I, it's okay. Yeah, but yeah. you know that's that's the impression you get when you see this, and that doesn't jump off the page. And I'm, I'm sure there's other work that you, you you're doing, but um, it does concern me a little bit that, and given what we've just heard from the Gawler Business Development Group, um, and given that the collaborative work that you've been doing with them with businesses, it, it, it yeah it does concern me. I'll be honest. Well, Karen. There are a couple of different ministerial submissions that go in. One is in the infrastructure or that headline projects. The other is grant programs that support individual business investment. And they are the, you know, the smaller enumerated ones. Business put them forward. And it's part of the big overall, I suppose what this is meant to do in a way is build business confidence about the kind of investment interest or projects that are being built up out there, which, which fit within the strategic intent to build bigger industries that have greater competitive advantage in the region. I'm very happy to redo this slide, probably not on one page though, which highlights which of these projects are all relevant. But as I said, that it was just a, um, an editing, type, editing typo that the floodplain management work fell off there. And my checking, as I did, with Gawler's priority projects is they fitted within the categories of projects that are listed here. So mo for the most part, they're intended to be categories of projects. Even that Barossa Culture Hub precinct, there are multiple projects within that. Um, as is the same with the health facilities in Gawla. But I'll get back to you with, with what this looks like with the layers behind it and Gawla related projects. Any other questions for Anne from elected members? Yes. Uh, I'd just like to say uh, thanks very much, Anne, for all that uh, uh, that you mentioned there, but uh, I'd love you to keep saying that because uh, I think you've got to admit Gawler is the best of town and country. <laughs> now, where have I heard that before? No worries, as long as everybody else can listen to it. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else before we move on? No, excellent. Thanks, Anne. Um, stay on because we'll obviously be chatting later on. Uh, yeah, sure. With I'm here. Um, so, as Henry mentioned in the introduction, um, Andrew Morris is unfortunately ill and can't attend this evening, but he did provide through some information around the Business Innovation Hub's immediate response to the pandemic. Uh, and first of all, there's the offer of the 50% off the first month for any new members, which is an ongoing offer uh, that he started just as a pandemic hit. Um, so that's trying to attract and retain, uh, sorry, attract new um, membership into the hub, noting that um, from his reporting, the hub was looking at a decline of about 80% in revenue from memberships over the three month period um, 
April to June because of the pandemic and a lot of people choosing to stay at home rather than uh, action, actively participate in the services at the hub. He's also put in place uh, membership fee deferrals and waivers um, for members who come to him uh, um, requesting such deferrals and waivers. He's worked very hard to maintain the memberships, even if they're not using the full services of the hub. There have been a core group of um, hub members who have come every week or more than during the uh, pandemic, uh, but he's also conscious of retaining people to come back into the fold and we're seeing more and more come back uh, in the last week since stage two restrictions um, were put in place by the state government, which is good. And the other aspect that uh, Andrew was doing was assisting with business onboarding to the, the Gawler app. Um, so taking the referrals from Gawler Business Development Group and Council uh, to onboard those businesses in through to the app. Uh, along the process of this, he's also been providing uh, mentoring and support to hub members, uh, business resilience in that space, um, especially as members started to drop off uh, and started to question the viability of hub membership considering they're working from home as well. So he was working on business resilience with a, a number of those uh, members. Then for his uh, recovery side of things, um, Obviously, there's a collaborative nature of everything we're doing uh, between the town of Gawler, RDA, Business Development Group, Gawler Business Development Group, um, and the hub will be a key player in that. There'll be a business coaching program uh, that will be rolling out based on recent events, so a pandemic coaching, so to speak, uh, supported um, through the hub and through to the Gawler Business Development Group, definitely with their work that they're doing in, in that space. Um, Andrew's offering pathways to financial support and investment. He's working uh, hard with a couple of local investors uh, to actually invest in startups um, that are wanting to come out of the crisis. Um, investing in uh, business readiness for hub members as well as the community. Continuing that support up for startup and entrepreneurs that the hub does. Uh, and is maintaining the view of that Murray Street digital precinct feasibility. This is a, a project he's working with Sabernet on to try and extend the Gig City precinct out of the hub through to the main street and in, um, through using the hub's fibre connection, uh, but distributing through to the business's high speed Wi Fi connections, uh, potentially fibre connections if there's some investment in it. Uh, but maintaining, uh, creating more digital precincts within Murray Street itself. Uh, and finally, as the slide is saying, looking at the hub being a driving force behind a technology company, uh, looking at um, being based in the Gawler Mill. So that company itself will be starting to employ shortly and there'll be some announcements around the company structures and names and all that sort of stuff shortly. Um, but there's um, good activation of um, the mill that's been worked on there. That's it in a nutshell for the Business Innovation Hub. Without Andrew present, I'm able to answer some questions, I suppose, if I've got the <laughs> answers, but I'd have to defer most of them on notice to Andrew if they're more specific. But if members have questions, feel free to ask and we can always forward them through. No questions there? No problems. Okay, moving on to the town of Gawler. So what we um, did uh, for, in terms of economic development and business support, um, straight away as um, the outbreak of the pandemic in late March, lobbying and advocating for investment in the government re uh, for recovery. So we have been proactively lobbying um, state government um, to provide greater investment in that recovery space. Also proactively seeking stimulus funding opportunities as council has been quite aware through various reports that we've provided over the last couple of months. Uh, there's been a fair bit of that around that we've been applying for. Um, working with those businesses on the red tape reduction has been a key driver for our environmental health team as well as our compliance officers, uh, ensuring that businesses can trade in the current environment. So those businesses that uh, had to divert to full takeaway, how does that occur and how do they actually manage that takeaway service in the actual restrictions imposed by the uh, state government around the pandemic. So EHOs have been in and out of businesses actually providing guidance on what they can and can't do. Um, and then in the recovery stage one, it's obviously when outdoor dining came in. So it was again, working with those businesses who had outdoor dining area capabilities and ensuring that they meet the compliance requirements, but also working with them on education and training to ensure that they can meet their needs around hygiene and those sorts of things. 
We've also had uh, weekly discussions, um, as Henry mentioned, with our partners, RDA, Global Business Development Group, and Andrew at the Hub, looking at other ways to assist local businesses. And a lot of that has come out through delivery programs from the other agencies, not specifically from the town of Gawler, uh, as the other agencies are better placed to deliver those works than the town of Gawler is at this point in time. Um, looking also, as Council is quite aware, um, we've had that resolution of council recently around the financial stimulus relief. We will be obviously engaging with the Gawler Business Development Group on the criteria for um, the discretionary rebates uh, around business um, rate rebates uh, that we're looking at. Um, as council is aware, we're internally looking at the $2 million procurement so that um, money coming back into the local economy and ensuring that we engage local in various projects. The executive team are still working through uh, what that looks like in terms of those projects that uh, aren't in the current budget draft above the line um, and making sure that council will be informed of that as soon as we can to meet that two million. And there's also um, the supplementary money that's coming through from the federal government, uh, which was part of the $500 million package of new money that uh, got distributed around the 457 councils around Australia and the town of Gawler has received $405,000 of that. That money is specifically for projects that were not in budget deliberations um, as above the line. So we need to ensure that we can expend um, money in that space. And again, council will be uh, across that journey as more comes to light on what projects may be fit that criteria because it is stimulus funding and investment and bringing forward projects. So these might be projects where uh, thought about in two or three years time that we can bring forward. But from our focus perspective for council, it's all about local investment and local employment, local job creation um, out of that um, stimulus package. Also, uh, we've been working with Gawler Business Development Group, as Karen aptly put, around um, connecting with the app. We've had a lot of council staff contacting businesses, as has the Gawler Business Development Group, and referring businesses through. Uh, we've also been proactively um, seeking feedback and providing um, feedback through to the app uh, developers around um, what we can do to improve the interface with our customers, as well as what we can do to improve the interface with our businesses. There's been a fair bit of heavy promotion of the app through town, uh, through local media as well. And um, the basis behind all that from our perspective was it, we believe the app provides businesses with an opportunity to get into that digital uh, world at a low cost price point and especially subsidised through the Gawler Business Development Group. For those members of that group, it's free for the first six months, which is an excellent opportunity uh, for them to come on board and get into the digital marketplace. As um, both Karen and Trevor alluded to earlier, uh, businesses weren't really digitally ready when the pandemic hit and they suddenly realised that they needed to be. So this app is one opportunity for them to get into that digital marketplace. And we're progressing that as we go. Finally, in our re recovery part, obviously the um, economic stimulus package is part of that recovery, but we also want to be working very closely with our partners on um, recasting this economic development strategy, which is the second part of this session tonight, uh, ensuring that we increase the localised content and include stra strategies around that economic revival of Gawler. So um, looking at what we can do as council to further support the local economy and local businesses. Um, that recast will be presented to Council for Comment, uh, also be peer reviewed by Hudson Howes, and there'll be plenty of opportunities for all elected members in the community to contribute into the recasting of that strategy uh, as we move forward. So on that, uh, any questions from elected members about the Town of Gawler immediate response and recovery processes? Yes, Councillor Shanks. Uh, yeah, g'day David, uh, thanks for that. I was just looking at um, when you were talking about the $2 million um, to stimulate local jobs and um, you know get projects off the ground. How are we going to um, set up the prerequisite for that? I mean, I'm thinking from a builder's point of view, we're probably one of the larger commercial builders in the town. Um, so, and employing local staff and local trades is always something we try to do. So how, how are we going to set that guideline up while trying to be fair to everyone? $2 million, although it sounds like a lot, is, is one project um, in, in real terms. 
So how are we thinking about divvying that up? So um, we're still working through it at executive level. However, um, we definitely can influence procurement locally in our procurement policy. There's actually uh, requirements to uh, people responding to tenders uh, to actually provide us with statistics on local engagement within their tender responses. And the projects that we're going to fund with this $2 million will be uh, required to have extremely local content in terms of those contractors engaged. Um, to answer your question about the, the $2 million, we at the moment at Executive don't believe that it's going to be a one project scenario. Uh, we're looking at spreading the love across a range of industries because there's been more than just the one industry impacted. So a one project servicing one industry may not be the best result to provide economic stimulus to our local community. Uh, an example uh, that I personally raised at our, our initial executive meeting on this was, is there an opportunity for us to look at some of our digital content, um, especially around our Welcome to Bagola video, which is uh, old-ish now. Um, you know, the building here at the administration centre is actually still a take in that video. So is there an opportunity to engage a local filmmaker or photographer who hasn't been able to do wedding photography over the last three months because there hasn't been weddings occurring in that space as part of that engagement? So we're not necessarily saying it's a one project, two million, if that makes sense, Councillor Shanks. Yeah, absolutely. Just a follow up one then. Um, yeah, no, that, that's, um, that is good to see because that's, yeah, my main thing would be, um, yeah, sharing that love. So I guess my next um, question on that, you, we're talking about tender processes and uh, when we do our work for dip tie and everything like that, we do see the local economic tests and, and that is a very common thing for us. Um, if we are wanting to spread the love to our local businesses, we do need to be cautious on how we're going to do that because although that might be a world that, that some may be used to, um, your local wedding photographers aren't going to be. Yep. So if they're contracting people in and they go, oh yeah, no, no worries, we can, we can get locals in, we need, to make, we need to be very, very clear on the parameters um, and how we're engaging and putting things out for tender as well. So I'll be interested to see, yeah, how, how yeah. we advance with that for sure. Uh, Julie noted, Council Thanks, definitely part of the process that we want to adopt. Uh, Karen Redman, Mayor Redman. Uh, thanks, David. Um, just um, part of any recovery isn't just economic, it's also social. So uh, what has the Town of Gawler done in the social recovery and what are they planning to do in the social recovery? Because so, it's intertwined, it's intertwined. Yeah, I 100% agree with you, Mayor Redmond. Uh, so part of that discussion is around what projects we could deliver that were below the line operational projects of which community projects sit within that. Uh, obviously, we've also noted um, from feedback from our sporting clubs, community organisations and those sorts of things about the need to invest in those facilities as part of the recovery. Um, so there's community out come projects in that as well. But also um, we do believe, and we've already discussed at Executive, uh, the need to have some community projects, engagement, social interaction projects to assist with that recovery. Uh, Revitalisation of community connection is definitely part of that. I can't give you specifics at the moment because we're still working through it. However, it's definitely within our thinking mix around what we could fund out of that $2 million. And any, any uh, comments around main streets, because that's come up statewide around the importance of main streets and village centres and town centres and how local government has a key role in uh, providing that vibrancy uh, yes. and bringing people into business precincts so that, you know, businesses do, do then get access to customers. So uh, just some comments around that. Certainly, Mayor Edmund, uh, actually interesting. Uh, Kirsty and I were spitballing yesterday on this exact matter and Kirsty was coming up with some great ideas around how we might be able to create some activation from our Civic Centre, putting stuff on the balconies to draw people into town as um, open air concerts or stuff like that, uh, small events to bring people into the township, working with traders to get them out onto the street pavements as there an opportunity to do chalk art, murals, mandalas, those sorts of things as uh, sort of a, a passive public art that people can just happen upon, but we can advertise it and hopefully draw people into the main street to have a look. So those sorts of things are definitely part of our thinking pot at the moment. Again, specifics to come, uh, but yes, definitely part of the mix. Uh, Councillor Shanks. 
Uh, this one's probably more for Karen. Um, so at the moment, obviously, we're talking about the $2 million um, stimulus that we're hoping to inject into the local business, local community. Um, what is the feedback from the Gawler Business Development Group around that figure and how Gawler businesses think it should be injected? Um, yeah, hi, th thanks, Nathan. Um, we haven't actually put that question to the businesses at this point because they're far too focused on trying to survive. But however, that is something that we will be discussing with them fairly soon. Um, we think it's vital that the business community does have some input on how the money would be spent or where the money should be spent. And I think the fact that we have so many um, micro businesses within the town, it needs to be something that will um, give them that visibility that I was speaking about when we looked at our marketing. It's making sure that they're, they're more visible with two people around the region so that we can get engagement, get more people coming through. I do um, like the sound of what Kirsty um, had uh, advised David about. I think very small, um, simple, easy to put together, community events absolutely will bring more people in. And I think that's a great way to spend the money. Councillor Tolley. Thank you, David. I guess you can hear me. Yes. <laughs> This is, a, I guess, a, 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 a big picture question, which I'm going to pitch towards Anne for RDA and maybe Mayor Redmond for um, the LGA. Um, we've seen, Gawler took a, a very strong stance with a number of motions to support the increase in New Start. Remember we had delegations, a young man came and spoke to us um, the anti-poverty movement. And we made a, a strong stance and said that we believed that New Start was not a living wage. What we've seen with the federal government with the pandemic is instantly recognised that New Start um, is not a living wage, uh, virtually doubled it. I think they now call it job seeker. Now, currently uh, to get job seeker, um, you're getting an injection of money to help you survive, but you don't have to go and engage in employment of any kind to get it. Those that have a bit of an understanding about modern monetary theory and what's called the employment guarantee have an understanding that a very similar model exists, but it comes with the caveat that you must be engaged in a form of employment to receive that payment. It's a safety net. We've seen it in the past, it was termed work for the doll. Um, it is a similar thinking to that. And we've also seen things like Green Corps, if you remember, disbanded by Tony Abbott, but Green Corps was a way of engaging um, and reskilling people and giving them um, decent employment. The idea of the employment guarantee or uh, work related for job search would be that councils, um, and they would be a perfect group, would be saying, we can employ those people. In fact, if you looked at the jobs that are on the list that councils would love to get done, it's never ending. Um, and we're talking everything that we try to plug volunteers into to a range of skilled jobs that, that we would need to get done um, around Gawler. Uh, there's no, no end to what we could get done. Why, why can't we get the LGA and the RDA to join the voices that are, we're hearing them at the federal level that are saying this very thing, keep job seeker going, but morph it into a form of civilized work for that payment. And when you're engaged, and you would know this well, Anne, when, when people are engaged in work, their, their whole well-being, um, you would know this too, Karen, the two Karens, that when, when a person is engaged in work, their self-esteem goes through the roof. There's a whole range of other benefits that come from it, from the socialising, the connections with people. While they're also engaged, they're developing skill sets and the training in the skill sets is documented becomes their CV. 
when the private sector picks up, those people are job ready to be picked up by the private sector. And the money they get as a job seeker is never enough to thrive on, which is why they don't want to stay there, but it is enough to survive on. It's a decent humane, humane um, income for those people. Now, it's now it's proven that that amount of money is needed to keep those people alive. We're always going to have that pool of people. If local government was to join the voices that are happening federally, supported by the likes of ADA and, and the LGA really getting onto this and lobbying state and federal governments, we could see a real sustainable transformation where we would always be the pool, councils are the best place, we would be the pool that would offer that type of engagement, training. It doesn't cost us anything because this is federal money, but we are the people that will pick those people up and say, come to us, we have jobs ready for you. Now, if we sat and brainstormed, you could imagine how many we could get done. Everything from, we run a training session with a stonemason, we get every one of our rotting walls around Gawla rebuilt. We get tree planting along our steep creek beds and we get all of that restoration work done as the Green Corps used to do. Um, we can train them in a range of other skills such as concreting, paving. Um, there's even the beautification, the, 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 the graffiti, um, working with the elderly, supporting it. The list would go on. Um, so yeah, it's a big picture thing, but I'm, I'm throwing that out to um, Mayor Redmond, LGA, you, uh, Anne, with RDA. Um, what do you think? Is this, did, can you see the benefits of long-term where this would be a, a thing going forward? Federal government continues to pay that decent living wage. We engage and skill those people up. We, get, we are winners because we get um, lots of projects done. We support the dignity of these people much better than just ever sitting at home and just getting a payment and not connecting with other human beings and not developing skills. Karen, if you'd like me to start, I would just say that, you know, certainly in principle and aspirationally, it makes a whole lot of sense. Um, I think practically in the past, it's been very difficult to administer for governments is why it's disappeared after a while. It can be costly to administer. But on your proposal, in its um, federal government, I take it paying the local government administration for this, as well as paying the, the job seeker wage to the workers, might, may well be a viable option. I know there have been other programs with, um, where people got double the dole if they did an, almost an internship with business. And the most successful of those projects was when local government ran them because they had a commitment to the outcomes rather than a business doing it and finding that it took too much trouble to supervise someone and therefore the whole thing fell away. So I've actually got my um, regular phone conference with Minister Marino tomorrow morning. I'm happy to raise it if that's the will of the, the chamber saying this is a call from our, uh, one of our local governments. And certainly I think it's, it's something worth exploring because there won't be enough jobs to go around um, in the immediate future is the general consensus. And so to create those benefits may well be worth looking for, but I think local government does need to think about what's involved in the, in the, the practical delivery of this. And is there an appetite for local governments collectively or whether it could be just maybe some local governments opt in to be part of a scheme, um, there would, you know, I would, I would need at some point to be sure that they want to do that before I went hammer and tong at it. But as a suggestion, I'm happy to take that to the conference tomorrow as something that's arisen worth exploring from a policy point of view by the federal government. So just on the LGA, there was a previous um, traineeship that local government ran through South Australia, the state government gave the LGA a few million dollars to run a traineeship that was really successful. And it was very much owned by local government as against the work for the Dole scheme, 
uh, that was run federally, and that's where a lot of those administrative challenges came in when you couldn't get in contact with people, et cetera, and it was difficult to administer uh, because you had people, I guess, sitting in Canberra and, yeah, it wasn't as well run uh, as um, the traineeship. Uh, the traineeship program, Ian, is being talked about again, I know, uh, and that is, um, it's not something that's been endorsed as yet, and it certainly hasn't come back to the LGA board, but there is uh, talk around whether that is something that um, state government could invest in through local government. And I think that's um, really worthy. And like Anne said, and like you said, Ian, you know, I don't think anyone disputes uh, the inadequacy of um, um, the dole and how it has been. And particularly if you live in the Eastern Seaboard, you're pretty much homeless. You can't, you can't afford uh, the rents. In fact, people, most people who've lost their jobs can't afford their rents now. And there's empty rentals. The Airbnb market has fallen through the floor. And there's some significant issues on, around homelessness in the Eastern Seaboard as against here, which will also come here as well uh, if, you know, these sort of things aren't uh, sorted out. So I don't think anyone, and certainly I think the, um, uh, the well, it's called Job Seeker now, uh, but I can't remember what it was called before, but um, Job Seeker uh, or the previous Job Seeker, the LGA has a position that does support raising that allowance. And that was previously endorsed, I think, at an AGM, I think last year. Uh, so there is a position from the LGA around supporting that. Um, but I think it, there's a whole layer of things that local government need to do. Um, there's advocacy, but there's also action as well. And I think that this, this economic recovery requires not only social issues and justice, social justice issues and wage justice or um, you know, a, a living a living wage that people can actually survive on uh, is something that uh, surely we should be advocating. So I don't disagree with that at all. Uh, but is that should that be our focus? It certainly should be in the mix. But however, I think our priorities have to be how we deliver on local outcomes initially as a local government, how we work in partnership, how we how we. Uh, I guess, leverage money that might be coming from federal government. Now, bear in mind that local government does not now have a table at the new national, uh, uh, what, what do they call it? The national parliament, whatever they're calling it, around the table that is the new COAG. COAG is now defunct and local government had a, had a seat at that table. And that brought with it huge advances. And one of the big outcomes was that money we've just received through uh, the advancement of financial assistance grants that was brought forward, plus more money. That just didn't happen. That happened because the local government, the Australian Local Government Association sits there. David O'Loughlin, our prospect mayor, who's the national president, advocated really, really strongly, as did many other, many other local government um, uh, stakeholders. And we got a really incredible outcome with Minister McCormack stating the role that local government has in delivering projects and delivering other programs and community infrastructure, a whole range of things that local government will be delivering on. So we do have an opportunity right in. Uh, we need to get our messages right. I think social justice is one of those because that, will, that, will, that won't go away, uh, but it's just one that uh, we need to advocate on, I think. So I've got next is uh, Councillor Fraser, then Councillor Koss. So Councillor Fraser. Yeah, um, Councillor Turley, your suggestions were really good. Um, there's lots of layers to it though. Um, I think new start, you either had to be applying for so many jobs a week or you had to volunteer and you had to volunteer up to 15 hours a week. And then we have a lot of volunteers in Gawler that do that. Um, and I don't know whether job seeker is going to be the same thing where they have to volunteer. Um, a lot of the places that survive on volunteers only survive because of the new start. And I do agree, it wasn't enough, it's not enough money for sure. But a lot of our volunteers come through that way. Um, there was another project called employment skills or something, something like that. And I know as a community house utilized it a couple of times. 
but in all fairness, most of the stuff they did, we had to redo because it wasn't really, you know, it wasn't, it was really hard. And half the time, half of them didn't turn up. So you were relying on something being done and it didn't, and it was just really difficult to control. Um, I do think council have used that system at some stage. And even I think the mural wall on the toilets at Julian Terrace, I think they were built by um, work for the Dole years ago. I think that's how they got there as well. So although in theory, what you're suggesting is really good, there's a whole lot of levels and uh, things to control that are quite often aren't controllable. So, you know, but um, it, it's worth looking into to see if they can do it better next time. Thanks, Councillor Fraser. Councillor Kosh? Yeah, look, thanks. Look, I've, um, actually, I've got a fair bit of experience in this space. For a lot of years, I was a Skillshare manager. In fact, at one time I was um, project managing two Skillshares that were 800 kilometres apart in, um, in remote Australia. So I've got a fair bit of experience in this area. And I've been working, I've worked in uh, CDEP, LEAP, Green Corp, and worked for the Dole. And um, although, and um, a lot of that, a lot of that work, I, I was involved in that because of social justice issues. And I felt that people needed to, uh, if they could have an access to an economy, they have, you know, their lives improve, et cetera, et cetera. And what, ha what happened was that those programs went from uh, really helping the long-term unemployed to um, just getting outcomes. So you're actually forced into only selecting and helping people that you knew were going to get a quick outcome. And the long-term unemployed were sort of left to one, one side, in fact, went backward. Uh, also, there was, a, there was real time limits. So, for example, it might be a 20-week program. So, so you, in the end, people were churning through these programs um, and there wasn't actually a lot of uh, real employment outcomes at the end. I know you could think, you know, we can think about uh, um, outcomes, but it's very, very difficult. Um, and also there's a big component of training um, and education. So there's a, there's a whole, it, it's actually quite an in-depth um, in, in depth sector to be involved in and you need to be really specialised in that area uh, to actually get, get some outcomes. So I would uh, just voice uh, some, you know, some warnings there that although it sounds fantastic and when I was involved in it, you know, I was involved in it because of the social justice side of things, but it really did, um, it did turn into the, the government wanting some outcomes. And what happened was you, in the, it, when, I, when we started, you got paid, to, you know, to assist people especially long time employed. And in the end, you only got paid when, uh, when they got a job. So you only actually started to work with people you knew would get a job. So it's really fraught with a lot of um, pitfalls and, um, and really, you, really think, you need to really think it through um, then, um, you know, then to just saying it's a, you know, it's a really good idea. There's a, there's a lot, of, lot of things you need to, to think about. For example, we even in council, we, the community um, work, program, you know, people that, you know, come through the magistrate and have to do work. We do that on council, people go around and pick up papers and stuff, but that still requires a fair bit of, um, a fair bit of input from council. In fact, I was involved in one of those schemes when I worked for another group and, you know, a lot of people just turn up, for example, and you had to run around and all of a sudden, you know, they wanted to sign off on things. It really does, does become um, a very um, fraught um, exercise um, if you're not careful. So I'd, I'd, I'd be very, I'd um, just be cautious. That's what I'll be saying. Yep, thanks. Thanks, Councillor Kosh. I've got Councillor Hughes and then Councillor Sawley. So, Councillor Hughes. Um, yeah, I, I agree um, with, with trying to look at these schemes. Uh, I think some of them have been really successful in the past, especially uh, the local government uh, traineeships, uh, I think have been really well because they are well supported. Uh, it is a real job and they are really, learning uh, lifelong skills. Uh, I think it's really important if we can get uh, our young people experienced in, 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 in workplace scenarios. I uh, agree with Councillor Kosh that that needs to be done really well. Um, yeah, like Councillor Kosh, I've been involved. Uh, I was actually the chair of employment directions for a, a number of years, which, which actually helped run a lot of programs across the state. Um, and, and yeah, the, the outcomes um, varied, but um, there were uh, a lot of long-term unemployed people that actually got employed through, through, through the systems uh, and, and it, it did work, but uh, it, it did re require um, a lot of um, behind the, the scenes uh, administration and assistance and, 
and really good um, team leaders and, and, and things like that. So, but I, I think um, local government would be really well placed uh, for interns, even apprentices, uh, you know, extra gardeners and, 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 uh, and people like that um, would be really good. Uh, our youth unemployment is really high. So even you know, getting people work experience, I, I think is really handy as well. So um, yeah, I, I would be supportive of uh, the LGA working through uh, the state and federal government to, to get to get some funds and and to set, and, uh, to w and work into the scheme. Uh, and I think it has been discussed from from my uh, discussions the last couple of weeks with with different people uh, in the local government sector that uh, the, the LGA are actually looking at uh, some some sort of in, internship, um, hopefully. And and I think the federal government. Uh, yeah, it would, would be great if they came on board and, and supported it. So I, I think that that's the way to go. Um, and and just, just keeping the, the processes as simple as possible, um, because I, I think sometimes in the past they have been very complex, uh, which, which makes it really difficult as well. Uh, so that was all. Thanks, Councillor Hughes. I've got Councillor Tooley then, Councillor Shanks. So over to you, Councillor Tooley. Um, yeah, thank you, and thanks for the contributions. Um, I'm not for one minute suggesting that we're, we restrict ourselves to thinking only of the models that have been there in the past. I think we're all aware of the flaws um, in the models in the past, and there have been a number of reasons for those, that some of them have been very badly thought through and they've been exploited, and government interference um, and the way they've, they've wanted to manipulate things hasn't been the best. What I'm inspired by is what I'm seeing coming out of America um, in terms of what's known as the Green New Deal. If you want to have a look at what you might call a 2020 version of this type of job seeker employment guarantee, um, you could do very well by looking at the Green New Deal. Um, and because I'm connected with that, I'm getting a, not, a, a lot of um, videos and emails that have been coming through for, for many, many months, well before we got into COVID. And um, all the ones that I'm receiving, they, I, I get mayors from rather large cities speaking. You get the people who are working in the programs speaking. And um, every one of them is transformational. And it, it's overcome the issue of the dole bludger notion because you can't get the payment if you don't get off your backside and get engaged. And it's a pretty simple, flat system. Um, you have to engage. Councils will offer you the program. You engage. Because you've engaged, you'll get the federal payment. You'll get that job keeper or job seeker payment. Um, and there is obviously some administration. There's obviously some tweaking because you have to um, administer these people. You have to um, look after them, train them. Um, and this is where you would tweak perhaps your existing staff and the roles that some of your depot people have as they work with these teams. Um, and, and I'll give you an example, you know, because we can easily defeat ourselves and say these things can't happen. I'll give you an example in education where we had so many kids falling through the cracks because one, one model didn't fit all. And um, we had a need to re-engage kids. We transformed our curriculum from, from being just a linear plan to go to university but we started to move into embracing TAFE at school. And if you go into most high schools now, you'll find what's called transition brokers. And these are, are people who will find school-based apprenticeships for kids, um, not, not a large number, probably anything from 20 to, to maybe 80 in a, in a large high school. Um, but they're kids who would have fallen through the cracks because they hate school. And these transition brokers, yes, you have to pay for them, but um, the benefit that you get pays for itself in that these kids are engaged in um, TAFE certificate one, two, three, while they're at school. They're working at school for two days a week, three days out. It's just an example of how um, a school embraced that program rather than giving up and defeating itself and saying it's all too hard. Schools across as a structure across the whole of South Australia embrace that model. And so we fight hard to not let those kids fall through the cracks. And the success stories are phenomenal. And yes, there is administration. So in this type of deal, if, if 
if it can work, if, you know, if we could convince the feds to say, listen, keep sending the money when there are people in need. And we as councils will be one of your big absorbers. Um, we, we'd love to look at what that looks like. That's the sort of thing I'm, I'm thinking of. I can't give you the full administrative model. I can certainly share with people if they're interested, a number of these uh, very interesting videos that are coming through from the States where it's actually been working for a number of years in local counties and in, in local, uh, with local mayors and local um, councils. Um, so yeah, look, it's a, it's a concept. It's, it's predicated on stuff that's been there before, but I'm not saying we replicate it totally. I just think, um, and it is a big picture thinking, that we're going to have to do an all lot of tweaking around the edges to support our businesses and give them financial support, yes. But this is probably one of those big picture things that maybe the LGA, the RDA councils can get involved in that can have a long-term future benefit for our communities and for council, win-win um, for those um, that are falling on hard times and do need that type of, um, of supplement. They'll always be there. There'll always be that pool of people where, you know, the private sector, we want them to thrive, but when the private sector isn't thriving, then government and local government have to step in. And this is the area where we can step in, provide a living wage, dignity, training, and get them ready to get back off that payment and back into um, the workforce. So yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Councillor Tully. Councillor Shanks? Um, yeah, look, I, I understand the, exactly what um, Ian's talking about. He's, um, he's touching on uh, the modern monetary theory, which was a very interesting conference that we um, went to, and the Green New Deal is definitely something worth looking into. I guess I have sort of relate um, my experiences. I don't have the sort of experience that Councillor Kosh and um, Councillor Hughes have in, um, in that area. Um, what I do have is a, a bit a fair bit of experience um, with different labour hire companies. Um, now these are all these are a range of of people. Um, some mildly skilled, some not, um, and, and everything like that, and everyone everyone in between. What we have seen um, is you get your you get your bad apples, but the fact that that's a there, the fact that there is a pool that we can dip into, for us as a, a business is very beneficial. Um, and we have had those success stories where we've hired these labourers just on a contracting rate. Um, you know, we need you for a couple of days. And then we have had the ones that we go, well, you know what, we actually don't want to let you go. So we'll steal them from the labour hire companies and, and then it will move on. I think what Councillor Tooley is sort of um, pointing out is if we can simplify a similar sort of structure that we're setting up um, these labour for hire or um, upskilling some people that wouldn't usually have it, we're not only providing, we're not only ticking the boxes on getting things done, we're also providing the social benefit of that person moving into masonry or uh, anything else, gardening, whatever else we want to put into it, that those values then go down the line into their family, their friends. So yeah, look, it's a very interesting model um, and I'd be pretty keen in, in running this through, um, floating it and seeing what it actually looks like. I uh, hear what Councillor Kosh is saying and the benefit of that glass half full sort of way of looking at it is the mistakes have been made. Um, now we can build on that. And especially with, I mean, just off the top of my head, I'm thinking of things like digital platforms and we're talking a lot of, of these sorts of things. I'm thinking of paralleling things like Uber, for example. Um, if a driver picks up a, a, a customer and they've done a bad job of it, well, then their rating goes down, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we could, we could look at the ones that really excel, really making it obvious that, um, you know, these unskilled people are really valuable and are moving in the right direction. And then the ones that aren't interested don't. But again, that's just thinking out loud, but um, yeah, interested to see where we go. Thanks, Councillor Shanks. Um, Anne, yes, Anne Moroni. Just a brief comment. 
Um, these, these are all great ideas. And I think the yes, you know, sometimes there's a moment in time where things can take. And I think the thing that might be in favor of these schemes working is looking at that job seeker supplement that was given during COVID could well provide a structure for motivating people to play willingly with these schemes and, and to, to lean in. Um, because if you might be entitled to that very basic level of support, but if you participate in either the volunteering or the uh, forming a pool of job seeker labour hire, um, that's an interesting concept to manage there for exactly the reasons outlined, or the civic projects team, then you're entitled to that supplement and you get more money. And I think the motivating factors there would be even greater to help people lean in and get those skills. So I'm certainly happy to take that discussion forward in my discussion with Minister Marino tomorrow. And you never know, we've seen some of the policy positions we've put up actually take hold and uh, watch that space. You just might see it again. So no, it was a really good discussion. Thanks, Anne. Yeah, I agree. Very good discussion. And thanks, Anne, for taking it up as an advocate for um, for us to the minister. So moving on in the workshop, uh, just going to move to the next slide and hand over to Kirsty Dudley, who's going to talk us through the this slide and, and what we're trying to achieve out of this. So thanks, Kirsty. Good evening, everyone. It's been some great discussion going on. Um, so we were hoping that um, Council would have got to um, the economic development report in the last agenda, but it was deferred. So um, this this presentation was kind of based the information that Dave gave on the previous slide is included in the, the recommendation of that report that will be going to Council at the special meeting. Um, so we, we did feel like we had would have had that conversation in the chamber first before we came here, but that's okay. We can we can work with what we've got. Um, so at this point with the economic development strategy, we really want to get some input from um, from everyone in regards to the, the COVID nineteen nineteen response that you've seen that that's been underway and happening, and also the economic impact of that response, what we're seeing in our community and how we want to um, pull that into the economic development strategy and how we might need to reshape the strategy, um, not only to include that, but also, you know, with the other, are the, are the other elements that were in the strategy prior to COVID-19, are they still the key priorities that we, got, we want to focus on or have we got some new ones? Um, so this is our opportunity to have that first little bit of a discussion. There'll be plenty of other times that we can have input through this process as well. But this is just kind of to kick us off in a direction tonight. Um, so our first slide has the um, pillars that are that are currently in the draft plan, which had, had been deferred previously from Council. Um, so there's six pillars. And I'd just like to hear some discussion on whether the pillars are still valid, uh, whether we need to combine some, whether we need to um, create um, anything new to, to suit COVID-19 or, or are we just looking at how COVID-19 would stretch across those pillars? What sorts of things that um, you think the impacts of COVID-19 are going to have for our plan? At the end of the day, though, I really like everyone quite often when we're talking about COVID-19, we really focus on the negatives that have happened and the negatives that we're going to be facing over the next year or two. But I think I just want to also stress that there has been actually some real positives come out of COVID-19. Obviously, horrid situation, terrible for people you know, not only because of the virus, who, who've actually caught the virus, etc., but just the impact on our economy and families and everything. But we've also had things where, in like in our community, if I take the, um, the presentation that we've had tonight, we can note that Gawler Business Development Group and Council have had huge interaction with our local businesses just in the last few months. Now, that wasn't that wasn't on the, that level of interaction and engagement was not on the cards prior to COVID-19. It's had to happen and it has happened, but at the same time, 
now the businesses know and, and can utilize those services that they know are there and those, those the app and other opportunities that are there for them. And they now also are really well connected in and realize there's a real value to engaging with council and, and school of business development group. Whereas I would say, you know, some businesses really were kind of like, I'm too busy running my business. I don't, don't want to talk to you, I haven't got time, that sort of thing. I think now they're starting to see the value of having that extra support. Um, and there's also been things like increased access, accessibility for people to things because things have been going out online a lot more. Um, uh, the Small Business Commissioner the other day, I was in a, a, um, the, um, a meeting, a, a webinar with him, and he was saying that they'd had workshops that they would normally have, you know, 30, 40 people come to physically in the city, they've put out online, they've had 1200 people attend a webinar or a training session on digital marketing and things like that. So those sorts of opportunities have all come about and they're re-looking at how they deliver in the future because of COVID-19 and, and the lessons we've learned through this. So I'd really like, as we're going through this process, to look at the positives that have come out of it and also maybe some of the things we don't want to lose once we don't want to just go back to the old normal, we want to go back to a new normal and a better normal. So, um, so just think about those things. So I'd like to open up the floor. I'll let David manage who's raising hands and things because I can't see that. Um, so some conversation, who'd like to kick it off? Councillor Shanks. Yeah, thanks for that, Chris. It was really, um, it was, yeah, it is good to point out some of the positives. Um, I think while people are scrambling, it is it is lost. Um, I'm definitely um, humbled by seeing the Gawler Business Development Group, for one, um, really stand up and and be very active and quite speedily active as well. Um, that's really, really good to see. Uh, and the community, I'm actually really happy to see um, the collaboration between community and business. Um, that's been really interesting to see. Uh, just, I mean, I know Councillor Little, for example, made a, has been making an effort, as I'm sure we all have, um, to just use, utilise local businesses. Um, that just seems to be a, a standard thing that everyone's trying to do, you know, instead of going to get your lunch from a non-local business, you you shop local. So that, that's been really good. Um, Looking at the pillars that you've got there, uh, back to you, back to your question. I think that subjectively we could apply all those pillars um, in the current climate, previous climate, or future climate. In in my opinion, because they are kept as a an umbrella title. Um, I guess um, one of the other things that you, you picked up on around was digital. Um, platforms. I, I'm also noticing even just our council meetings, for example, we are getting so many more views, so many more watches, um, which is a level of engagement that we weren't before. Um, so I guess from a personal level, I like to see um, what that looks like after we're all said and done um, to keep that engagement can keep that momentum. But yeah, like I said, as it sits right now, there isn't anything there that I feel you need to change to tailor COVID-19 because it is a bit broader umbrella, but um, yeah, happy to hear others' comments. Thanks, Councillor Shanks. Councillor Tooley. Thank you. Um, I'm asking myself what, if we'd allowed uh, businesses to participate in this workshop tonight from Gawler, um, and we'd allowed them to speak to us. And I'm presuming that a number of them are out there. Well, I know some of them are because they've contacted me. So I'm, I'm guessing they're, they're watching if they've been able to get the, the YouTube stream. So I'm asking myself, what, what would they be wanting to hear? Now, we've, we've I think, um, made some good moves with some good intentions, as has the Gawler Business Development Group. But um, my question is, are we really meeting the needs of our local businesses at this time? I know we're talking about things like the app. Um, we talk about the hub. We talk about Wi-Fi. 
Um, I think if we were to measure them, I'd, I'd be questionable as to whether they're really getting a big uptake and whether they're having an impact. Business I speak to and that speak to me, it, it comes down to one simple thing. It's about making money. And God bless them, that's what they've got to do. And to make money, um, in layman's terms, you've got to take in more than you spend out. So, you know, if you buy $100 worth of stock, you want to turn that into $300 or something like that. You don't want to have less income coming in than are your costs. Now, clearly, what the COVID has done to our businesses, and we can see that, and particularly at its height, although they're beginning to open up slightly now, we, we saw businesses close down, arcades close down. We know we've got some sections that are completely empty in our town. So what, what do those businesses actually need? Well, the only real input we've had was at the last council meeting, in the attachments, there were about a half a dozen letters, but there may be more now, that came in from businesses that said, what we want is financial help. And they made it very clear. They said, look, we're not getting any income. Um, we would like you to not charge us your fees and your rates for that period of time. Now, my memory is we got those letters from some of our big hotels. We got those letters from the picture theatre. We got those letters from the caravan park. Um, there's probably more. That's what's coming to my mind. My, my memory is that we only spoke about one of those and only gave respite to one, and that was the caravan park, which I don't begrudge that because they've actually done a good thing and actually stayed open at a loss to provide a home for some of the permanent residents. Big tick for that. But I don't think we answered the questions from those other businesses. They, they're, they're the ones, that's the only voice that, that we've currently got. They specifically wrote to us and said, can you help us? Some of them went on to explain and said, look, it's not just us. You have to understand that we as landlords, we are making sacrifices for the people that rent our businesses. We've got a flow on effect. We're helping them out. Now, um, and I'd like to know from Karen, um, from our, our uh, Gawler Business Development Group, might be able to give us an answer to this, but my my suspicion is that the one thing that would really help um, some of our local businesses is actually a, a financial help where we might say for the two, three, four, six months that you've been effectively not getting an income, we will not charge you what's within our power, rates. We won't charge you your rates for that period of time. Um, It'll cost us, it has to cost us, and we can make cuts. And that's what we've got to talk about. That's that's what I've been trying to get us to have a workshop about, is to actually get into our budget to own it as elected members, to tell our administration where we want to make some cuts, create some money. And I want the goal of business group to tell us where we can put that money so that when we come through this, we actually have some businesses that get through um, other than you know more businesses failing. And, and I understand workshops. I understand helping them to get e-savvy. I get all of that. But I think what they need is actual cash assistance. So maybe Karen Brown, maybe you could start by giving us an answer on that one. Um, yeah, sure, Ian. Um, you're spot on. No business goes into business to lose money. They all go into business to make money. And that's the only reason they go into business. Um, after they've gone into business, they may have you know, social impacts that make them want to do different things, but it's all about making money. Um, businesses have reached out to us. And as you said, there's letters from some of the publicans, there's letters from some landlords. We've got letters from some of the larger employers, some of the larger businesses in town who, who really are at the point of where they're, um, they're not sure if they are going to be able to continue because the impact has been massive. Um, one business I've spoken to, um, quite a bit in the last couple of weeks has lost, you know, well over half a million dollars in two months. And, and that's a massive amount of money for any business to lose and to try to recover from. Um, 
So absolutely, yes, if, if there is some way that these businesses can be given a reprieve on rates, uh, then absolutely this is something that's going to help them. And yes, it's only small. It's a small amount of money in the big scheme of things, but it's a small amount of money that's going to reduce their burden. And that's what we need to do. We need to reduce their burdens as much as possible over the next few months. Thanks, Karen. I'll just pass over to the mayor for just a moment. Mayor Redmond. I I can't put a hand up, so I'll go after Nathan. Yeah. He's got his, I'm just looking. Oh, certainly. Thank you. So, Councillor Shanks. Yeah, so I guess um, as, as Karen and, and Ian has pointed out there, and I completely agree with, with everything that was said there, um, when I'm when I'm hearing those things, I'm trying to visualise what we put that into when we talk about the six pillars that we have in front of us. Um, you know, some of those again. This is why I think that this is good because it's an umbrella thing. But uh, regional collaboration, regional investment, Main Street activation, all those topics to me tick the box of yeah, um, helping your businesses um, rate remission and and all that that's that's where i place them in those six um yeah just happy to, yeah, just wondering what everyone else is is thinking on on those pillars but yeah thanks councillor shanks over to mayor redmond thanks david um just on the um, economic internet internationalization pillar just some, maybe some comments from Anne around uh, short and long term. Uh, I mean, clearly there's certainly an opportunity digitally, but until we open our international borders, which is not going to happen in the short term, um, although Anne might be able to tell us something different, um, what that I see that as changing quite significantly. Um, so, just some comments around your thoughts, Anne, on that particular pillar. Um, certainly. The, one has to be creative in terms of opportunities for internationalisation of an economy which is essentially a services and population services economy. Um, however, there are some opportunities within for export, and I'm thinking you know, what pops into mind is Vuntlix, you know, with some of their export-specific products. Um, depend, not necessarily COVID affected, certainly um, the trade um, dispute with China um, could have a big impact on lots of things. But if we put that aside and look at the COVID response and what the impacts um, for economic internationalization are, one of the objects with the B2B program, for example, is yeah, helping businesses is the real bonus of it. And that is the now factor. The future factor, which includes an internationalization aspect, is the ability to grow the business's skills and demand for our professional services people in the region. And that's around the whole region. As Trevor mentioned, we have a number of B2B providers from Gawler who are doing work, not just in Gawler, but across the region. That B2B program has also been um, rolled out in York and Mid-North and in Riverlands, Murraylands, and we're talking to Limestone Coast. So what we're doing through that is getting customers for those professional service providers throughout the state. And the next step is, of course, you can pick up work internationally as a graphic designer with no problem at all. So digital platforms will help with that internationalization of knowledge workers. Um, education is another one more affected by COVID with some accommodation, um, having students again, mostly from Asia that would send high school students into to Gawler. Um, where's the big impact there is you then create connections with them with Gawler, they bring visiting friends and relatives in, and it does a lot of economic studies about that. It does have a um, decided impact on the economy. Another opportunity is equine industry. So that was in my map. The core equine asset at the moment in Gawler is, or well, is in Gawler, the, the Gawler race course, jockey club. If this big center does end up getting built at Roseworthy, 
with which centres all equine assets for the state. And we're actually talking to the three day event now about wanting to participate back in this region, which is interesting for Gawler. Part, one of the partner projects is a quarantine centre for horses coming in for international events. It offers an opportunity for all of the, the horse and equine businesses, trainers, jockeys, um, strappers, you know, low level jobs as well as high level jobs. So whilst at first brush, I looked at the internationalisation and I thought, hmm, uh, it's not immediately where you would leap with the Gawler economy. When I started to think about it, I certainly see opportunities. And the advantage of that is you start and create export markets, more, more markets for your customers. With internationalization also comes more interest in tourism, which is also export dollars if it comes in from overseas. And you start to build yourself as a center for the regional internationalization. So students at Roseworthy could ideally live in Gawler, much more for them to do there. Um, access to Adelaide, better health, better services, you start to connect with other international economies and become part of their value chain. So it was a bit long-winded maybe, but it's, a, it's not an easy um, grasp, but I think there's work, this is a long game. Um, it just doesn't fit in the same bucket as the short-term COVID responses, but if people are ever gonna be out of life support, as they say in Canberra, we need to be building on these long-term opportunities with new markets. Did that answer or not? <laughs> Did that well, help? <laughs> I was keen to know your comments of the impact that a pandemic of this size will have on travel and the capacity to do all of those things that you talked about. Um, and I guess we can't answer that question, but uh, you know, there's a- I... Well, in the short term, yes, but this internationalization, apart from the first example I mentioned, which was the knowledge economy and and um, being able to build your business so you can offer services anywhere in the world, right from the Gawler Innovation Hub. Um, the other things need long, some of them need um, sort of, they, they've got lead times. And in any view of the world, it won't stay locked up forever. People will either, a vaccine or a treatment for COVID will be discovered. Um, and as that rolls out, borders have to open. I've heard actually that Singapore Airlines is starting to fly into Australia very shortly. I don't know the detail behind that, but there may be some friendly travel in the first place with countries that will agree to mind who gets on the plane so we can mind who gets off it. Um, it's not gonna be open slather for the global travel but I'm not sure that global tourism is within Gawler's reach right now. I think it's a build. And that's why it's not bad to have it in your economic development strategy. So you're building on that and you're building uh, jobs for the future as well as jobs for now. Can I just add in there, and the um, economic internationalization, it was um, kind of also where we integrated the tourism plan into the strategy sort of saying yep. that you know we align with what our tourism plan has said around those sorts of markets yep. as well as that um you know building up our our smarter greener sustainable type industries and maybe being yep. able to export that out whether it be digital skills whether yep. it be advisory and consultancy services you know over the over the internet those yep. sorts all of things. part of the knowledge economy yeah exactly um can i just ask you and while we've got you um, going on at the moment um, your comment while we were working up the the slides and, the, and mm -hmm. this whole um, workshop session you talked about physical and virtual clusters possibly going under the regional collaboration and pulling those um, the connection of the different innovation hubs and things around the region together and those sorts of things would you like to make some comments yep. around that Certainly, and I approach this term clusters in its technical economic development sense, which is, it's not just groups of industries, but it's interconnected network um, value chains, which sees, and the best, it's best to use an example, which is the wine industry, where it's grape growers, winemakers, technical people, people who build things for the wine industry, people who provide services to them, tourism, people who provide hospitality to them, 
everyone who kind of makes money out of the fact there's a, there's a wine industry is pretty much part of the cluster. You're throwing research, education and government in there as the enablers and the enablers of the innovation and the next wave. And that's what a cluster looks like. Now at present, and we've done a fair bit of mapping of this uh, in the past, whilst Gawler certainly has a presence in many of those clusters, they're not contained in Gawler. Cl clusters are regional, but usually in a um, broader regional space. And um, I see Gawler as being connected with the regional clusters. So I thought regional collaboration, the physical and virtual clusters would be a strategy Gawler would approach on a more regional basis than ra rather trying to work up all the elements of those clusters as I described them within the town of Gawler. And I thought it was a, a very good sort of regional focus and therefore could fit within regional collaboration, physical and virtual clusters as being a pillar that made sense to be joined together. And then I would, while I'm now talking, um, local and regional investment would be a pillar for me. And as I said, I haven't been as deeply involved in the, the develop, you know, in, in the um, articulation of each of these clusters. So maybe other things were included. And the Main Street activation the mayor raised earlier um, as critical long-term, but right now, I think it gives all that support not all of the support, but much needed support to um, get people in the doors and aware of local business. Marketing pro promotion needs to be targeted, but that can be on an annual <coughs> basis. You can change what you're targeting from time to time. Thanks, Anne. We'll, we'll move to Councillor Kosh now. Councillor Kosh. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, David. Look, um, just, just talking on um, our response, I think we need a, a quite a measured response. Um, we are going to work through with uh, the Gawler Business Development Group to look at the hardship templates. We need to really develop that to actually be able to identify you know, the organisation businesses that, that need assistance, because some are doing quite well, some are doing pretty bad, some are doing so bad. So we need, we need that good template. So I think we need to have a measured response. I'm a bit concerned when, um, you know, we, we, we as a council, we just we need to stay viable because we're going to provide a lot of the procurement, a lot of the um, employment you know, activity. So we need to be careful that we don't slash too much. Um, you know that that we that we that we ourselves stay viable economically. You know, I'm a bit concerned if people start talking about taking out huge loans. Um, you know, there was you know comments about the government, federal government, printing money without actually not doing that. They're actually um, at another another meeting, they're actually not doing that. They're actually um, selling bonds, which they which they 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 then pay back. You know, if we borrowed money now to do something, um, we still have to pay it back. So that that sort of puts in into uh, I suppose jeopardy our long term financial plan. Um, in particular, you know, we need to be providing all those community services. So we need to think of the whole community here. So we we provide a lot of obviously we do provide a lot of services across our community. So we need to make sure that that's viable in the long term. So, so that's, that's those two issues there. I'm quite happy with all those, those uh, six pillars. I think they're good, Main Street activation, marketing promotion. Now, just on economic um, inter internationalization, for example, our business, my little business has just signed a major contract with an in, uh, a national industry association that we now we are now writing materials that are going to be sold throughout Australia, New Zealand and Southeast Asia. So just from our business, we, we're actually um, going, we have worked internationally before, but we're actually moving more now into that uh, international sphere as well. So that's you know, something that's happened in Gawler. It's, we're just a Gawler business that we've built up in Gawler. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that, you know, that people can do it, no, you know, no problems. I'm quite excited about the comments about, um, something like the digital hub or whatever in the, the mill. I think that's, a, a, that, that's quite exciting because that brings that the smart city or the smart town um, um, brand in, into play. Because I think Gawler should, should be marketed as a smart, clever uh, place to live and work. Uh, we found, we moved here from the Northern Territory in particular because of the, because what was here in Gawler, the, you know, the, the heritage, the close, we're close to the city, the, the, you know, the beautiful environment. You know, we brought our family here and we've grown here. So 
I think a lot of other people, you know, other people could come here and, and grow their businesses and bring up their families here. So I think that's something which should be really marketing. Um, and now with the connection, um, you know, with broadband, uh, we can work anywhere in the world. So I think that there's a lot of pluses for Gore. Um, so yeah, so just on that, I think, think that brand being a smart, um, integrated town, I think that's a very good brand. I think we'd be working on that. So, so just, just on that, I think, so, so overall, I think we have to have a measured response because we have to look after not only the businesses, but the whole community. And I'm just concerned that, that um, we make sure we, we maintain our financial viability over the long term. So we look after our asset management plan and a long-term financial plan. I mean, that's pretty critical. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Foss. Uh, Councillor Tooley. Uh, thank you. Um, when I look at those pillars, um, I, don't, I don't have any problem with those pillars, but I think they're the sort of pillars that you would have at any time. If you were saying uh, as a business plan or an economic development strategy, what would be you know, six good pillars, um, you would have those. So if you took COVID out of this, um, you would have those sort of pillars. Um, they'd be the things that you're looking to extend your market um, rather than just rely on local market, you want to get as much out of your local market, but you want to expand yourself um, more widely. So don't have a problem with those, but I do have a problem with badging them and saying, well, guess what? There are COVID response because most of those are long-term and you will naturally get an uplift if you engage with those. And if they're successful, you will get an uplift um, at any time. But I don't think they are targeting the immediacy of the COVID-19 response. If our federal government had simply rolled out that type of strategy and said, look, you know, the way for us to go forward is all of those and had not injected the massive and instant amount of monies that it did, then we would have fallen over. But what you saw was the government has those sort of pillars in its model uh, for growing business. But what it did was it, it brought in an, an extra set of pillars and it called them job keeper, job seeker, and it gave financial handouts and it gave business. And today, just today, we've seen um, the rollout for the other sectors that are in desperate need, the, the trade areas, uh, the, the move into the arts. These are immediate supports. They're not um, long-term visionary pillars their immediate injections. So that would be my criticism of, of those pillars. And you ask the question, are the pillars still valid? They are as a, a development strategy long-term, but for me, would not, I'd be embarrassed to badge them as a COVID-19 response. To me, they're not. COVID-19 yeah. is we, we need some immediate, smart, targeted financial support and targeted strategies. Now, I'll give you a strategy. I know that Karen Brohm's touched on this when you talk about e-ready, and, and this is very true. If I just take a little shop like the Gawler Sweet Shop, I'm guessing, but I would assume that they didn't have an online presence to speak of. If you compare that with Hague's, the great South Australian chocolate company, um, and I'm probably admitting a weakness here, but in the self-isolation that my wife and I um, had to go into, we found some very innovative ways to avoid contact with people. And so She's Apples has a fantastic online system and they will deliver it or you can go and pick it up. We discovered that. Local business. Um, local chocolate manufacturer, when we got online with Hague's, I, I could not have come across a more simple ordering system and it was here within two days and you go to the post office and you press the button on the outside you don't even have to go into the post office and the parcel service comes out and there's your box now i don't know whether gola sweets knows how to do that but something like that where they were given practical support whether you bring them into the hub whether karen brome team run a workshop but if they could if they're not already doing it, but a business like that, given that sort of practical help, here is a simple online platform where um, they may have not had that before. 
that's that's a sort of a practical help that they could be given now. In addition to what I believe is we need financial support. And um, I accept Councillor Kosh's point, and I'm not at any point an advocate for um, putting ourselves at risk, but we do have to give consider consider thought to financial cost cutting. We have to, just like the government's had to. Um, and borrowing might be part of it. Money is very cheap at the moment. And we know that sometimes borrowing is a good thing, but also we could really get stuck into our, our planned budget. And um, we've deferred ours, the federal government's deferred theirs because everybody's scrambling to look at what the new world looks like. We cannot just keep on with business as usual. I think we can find an awful lot of fat. We can defer an awful lot of things. We can create a significant fund that we could use to help uh, residents who are in, in rate stress, um, our businesses that are in rate stress, we could give significant financial support as well as the likes of very significant practical support, such as the example I just gave with Gawler Suites. Just to add a little bit more clarity, um, the economic development strategy is to go like three years into the, into the future. Um, so these pillars, we really do need them to look longer term. Uh, we do want to be able to capture that, that longer term picture and make sure that they function in a, a non-COVID world as well, um, because we'll still be running with some of these strategies and the longer term outcomes won't be coming until we're getting towards the, the longer term um, parts of the strategy and project. Um, so the COVID-19 response, we're kind of saying, what's the impact of our, we've already responded in the initial phase. We've kind of mapped out what the recovery section looks like for, for the different groups that are involved. And it was just kind of saying, well, how does the COVID-19 response actually impact on those pillars? Do we need to change them up? Can we can we tighten them up? Do we do we need another layer? You know, what what what's the feeling of, of everybody who's going to be working together to, to deliver the plan collaboratively? So um, just to you know, reaffirm that we're looking for that longer term picture as well overall. But this session, because we were sort of updating on COVID-19 and what's been happening with all the different groups that have been collaborate, collaborating and what they've been delivering, um, it was kind of like, well, let's feed that through into the economic development strategy while everyone's minds in that space. How is this going to impact on our long term strategy? And you know, what do we need to put into the strategy to help us recover and revitalise Gawler and help the, help the businesses, et cetera. So just a bit of clarification there. Thanks, Kirsty. Um, Karen Braum, then Trevor Taylor, then Councillor Shanks. Thanks, David. Um, just in response to Councillor Tooley, just um, one or two of the remarks, uh, comments, I should say, not remarks that you made. Um, you're absolutely right in that uh, businesses like Gawler Suites and quite a few others, not just Gawler Suites, had virtually no online presence or digital presence whatsoever prior to COVID-19. And although we knew this and we've been working with businesses for probably two and a half years now trying to increase digital presence. Um, but one of the first things that we did once we identified the current status, the operational status of each business that we spoke to is, you know, are they trading? Have they reduced hours? Have they uh, let go staff, et cetera? One of the next questions was, what have they done to try to continue to trade? And the discussions were along the lines of, have you considered home delivery? Have you got a Facebook page? Let's quickly get one up there for you so that you can start getting the message out there that you can deliver or, um, you know, can you collaborate? For example, we spoke to Mario from Gall of Sweets about collaborating with um, Tech Me and also with Tabletop Warfare. We said the school holidays are only a week or so away. Have a chat to these businesses and say, hey, why don't we put together a package that we can send, send out, deliver to the houses for these kids who are going to be on holidays, a game and some lollies. You know, so those were the sorts of things that we actually discussed with each one of those businesses who were struggling. Firstly, to get them some sort of very, very quick online presence um, and then also giving them ideas on how they can actually start to target a new um, a new group of customers. So yeah, you're right, you know, the online presence or digital presence in whatever platform that they choose to have is vital. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> Trevor, briefly. Yes, just to reply to you and Tuli, Gawler Suites um, through the B2B program in 2018, 
we actually approached him. I know Mario very well, Garuna, the owner. And um, Stella Digital um, was actually ga gave him three hours of B2B time to create a website for $2,000, an e-commerce platform. Unfortunately, he didn't take up that offer. This is some of the frustration I've been dealing with, and I think we've seen it also with the Gawler app, is we do need an education strategy to actually let business owners, especially in the brick and mortar uh, institutes, know the strength of basically online. So I've actually written a book and I talk about CRM. It's not only having a website, but it's having an e-commerce platform with a CRM platform where you, have, you collect all your customers' details. So you can start emailing your customers when it's the queen's birthday. You can put a lot of promotions in place. So you move from what I call relationship marketing, uh, sorry, transactional marketing to relationship marketing. So I think the Gawler app, we've seen that it's a whole education process to get people to actually understand how important it is to have a digital strategy. And unfortunately, COVID-19 has taught a lot of businesses and if there's some positivity that we get out of this, is that people are forced to go into e-commerce. If we look at uh, Priceline, Priceline's got one of the biggest, um, what I could say, brick and mortar businesses. They've got 450 stores throughout Australia, but they've got 7.2 million members. Their e-commerce strategy is so powerful that they can, can continually drive business through COVID-19. And it's really that education stream. So education is extremely important if we are gonna create sustainable businesses. You can give people cash and that's great in the short term and we can survive. But I think we need to create sustainable businesses and make sure that we also continually educating the importance of an e-commerce platform. So I think it goes hand in hand. Um, some of the opportunities and I'm looking at the pillars too. We must remember that though there is no international tourism, and I was chatting to the Barossa Tourism Chair, um, John Durbin, we must understand that there's a massive opportunity for local businesses to basically take an opportunity of $3.1 billion that's now gonna stay in South Australia because we don't have people spending money on international holidays. So there's massive opportunities I've heard of caravan sales going through the, the roof. I've heard of caravan parks being totally booked up. So there are also positive sides where we can capitalize on some of the issues that have created through COVID-19. So I just thought I'll share some of that information with Tuli. Thanks, Trevor. <laughs> Councillor Shanks. Uh, so the, the, the way that um, this workshop and presentation sits, so I'm glad that um, Kirsty was able to just clarify this. Um, although it does say eco dev strategy, um, development strategy, COVID-19 response, those six pillars don't read to me as, as our response by any means. Um, but what we have been flagging um, and we've sort of been, you know, I'm talking a little bit of a, a sidetrack on what we think we should be doing and, and everything like that on our on our response. Um, you know, we've got Councillor Kosh saying we need to do a measured response, which I, I think we are when we're talking to Gawler Business Development Group um, around setting the guidelines of um, rate remission, rate waiving, rate, defer, rate deferral, whatever we're talking about there. Um, Councillor Tully did point out a, a, a couple of good points around, you know, um, HAGS versus local um, lolly shop. I think that fits under marketing and promotion, um, personally. That's the sort of targeted response that um, Trevor's uh, just eloquently touched on um, around the education and that not only applies right now, but it also does apply across the board. And it would have been really, really good if we knew all the answers before the pandemic, because then we would have been pandemic proof. This may fast forward the ability to be the salesman out there on showing, look, these businesses are more viable now. And it, it shows that very clear, um, very clear comparison that um, Councillor Tully pointed out. So, as, a, as an overall, that's why I still believe that the six pillars 
are valid and they're valid previously, currently and future because examples that we're pointing out into the nitty gritty do fit into one of those six. So that's sort of the way that I'm reading. Although, although it does say COVID-19 response, that this isn't our response. We have our response and have had our response, but we are more responses to come if this makes sense. I think um, Councillor Tully put it in a, um, uh, a way last council meeting of COVID-1, COVID-2. You know, we will see, we will roll out, we will keep on educating ourselves um, and yeah, bringing the Gold Business Development Group on is, is is definitely the way to go about it. RDA is um, yeah putting their their two cents in on what they're seeing as a regional thing and feeding in to the Gold Businesses. Um, and I guess with Councillor Kosh's point, the businesses aren't the only ones in the town. You're absolutely right. I guess m my thinking of it um, and my my personal opinion that I'd love to be able to get to a point where I can factualise and back up is that if our economy, local economy is doing this and we have any means possible to lower that curve and make sure that we can cut them off here and prop them back up, that doesn't just help our business community, that obviously helps us, our overall economy. So therefore promoting our circular economy, but our circular economy also somehow feeds into economical internationalization because those businesses that are employing locals may be selling products um, overseas, which is still allowed. It's not all about the tourism, but we are still able to feed into that employee employment, which then covers business and local residents, which again feeds back to one of these pillars. So that, that's the way that I'm sort of translating it. And I might be completely wrong, but that's how I'm sort of taking it in. Thanks very much, I think Councillor Shanks. Nailed it, Councillor Shanks. Um, and I think also where we can leverage, we've got the economic development strategy, which you know is focused on the economics and, and revitalising and supporting um, business, et cetera, and, and the town as a whole, et cetera. But where we can leverage, like our Main Street activation section, where we can leverage a community event that's actually good for our community and our social outcomes, which also then supports business. So we're getting double bang for our buck. That's where we've got to focus first as well, is where we can really look at those multiple wins out of an investment into our community, which supports business through, you know, like I say, Main Street activation, we can have an event, brings people down the street. It might be still a socially distanced event. It might be over a week instead of having one concentrated event on, a, on one day. It might be all sorts of things. Um, but if we can get that social outcome of people, you know, feeling connected, coming into the town centre again and, and feeling like they're part of that community, seeing some art or whatever, or, or listening to some music, art in that sense. Um, so they've got all the feel goods from the social outcomes. And then we also get the businesses getting some economic outcomes out of it. Then we've got our double win for our one investment. And that's where we should really focus, I think, in the, in the short term strategies of our plan as well. Thanks, Kirsty. You had a list, um, David? Yeah, look, looking at time, I'll throw to Councillor Tully briefly and then Mayor Redmond uh, mm -hmm. yourself after that. But we'll be wrapping up very yeah. shortly. So just bear with us, Councillor Tully. Yeah, thank you, David. You can hear me? Yes, certainly can. Uh, look, I certainly don't want to um, in any way not recognise the, the, the personal financial hardship that many in our community um, are experiencing because they may have lost their jobs and they're not a business. Um, I don't want to forget them at all. And I know we haven't really talked much about them because we've been seeing the economic development strategy more as a business thing. Um, so let's not forget them. But also just to respond to Trevor's point about you know businesses being ready, um, that, that will not always be the answer because you, you couldn't have got businesses more ready than, than the likes of Jetstar and others where it didn't matter how ready you were, when you can't fly, you can't make money. Um, our pubs, for example, um, I, I don't know them all that well. I'm, I'm, D Damien, um, I know he would have invested on an awful lot of money to get that hotel, um, the exchange to where it is. You know, one of the, the big employers in the town and then 
um, no matter how ready he is, if you're not allowed to have people in your business, you know, there's only so much he can do. Um, and there are certainly other businesses. You're quite right. When we say be ready and have an online presence, and if you've got all the sweets, take the model of a, of a Hague's. Yep, that, that can work. So it's not ever going to be a one size fit all. And I don't know that we should expect that this is the only ever pandemic that we're going to live through. None of us are going to forget 2020. Um, and we certainly hope we don't get a, a second wave. But um, I, you know my beliefs about climate change, and I, I think we've just had a taster of what's coming if we don't address that situation, which means the, the economic waves will be significant. Um, and just one last thing, one last little thought bubble that I'll leave this with, with Karen Brome and Trevor. You might, this might be something useful for our friends at Gawler Suites. Do you remember the days when we had video places you went and hired a video, you went down to, remember that world? And do you remember when you went in to get your video, you also walked past the popcorn, the chocolates, the, uh, the lollies, and as well as getting your video, Trevor, you came home with a whole lot of fruit chocks and stuff like that. You've just made me think, just up the road from Gawler Suites is EB Games. That's the modern uh, replacement. All of those people that go to EB Games, those gamers, if they have not got a confectionery stand in EB Games, now's the time to get Gawler Sweets to, to get a, 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 a confectionery stand bloody in that shop and they'll both be winners. I'll leave that little gem with you. <laughs> Thanks, Councillor Lee. Mayor Redmond? Yeah, thanks, David. I think hopefully we've close to wrapping up. We've, we've been here nearly two and a half hours. Uh, but I think the discussion's been really good. Uh, I think we've, we've touched on a whole range of issues around COVID-19, but also short and long-term strategy as it relates to e economic development. We didn't really touch on social recovery, which I think is equally important and helps drive success. So I guess we'll see where that goes. Um, Trevor's point around the three point six or five billion dollars that people have to spend in South Australia, I think needs to be factored in if we're looking at this as a short term outcome as well. And I'm not sure that it does currently because why would it? It wouldn't have, we wouldn't have known that information. But I think that's really, really important. And I also think the value of community infrastructure, for example, libraries and the value that they have in the versatility that these spaces have for, as you say, Kirsty, different activities uh, and different roles. I think that there's going to be quite a bit of work coming out around the value of libraries and the value of uh, core local government activities that can drive uh, good, good economic recovery. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, David, I'll hand back to you, but I think it's probably time to wrap up. Thank you, Mayor Redmond. Uh, certainly is time to wrap up. This is the last slide we had on our presentation. Um, and so just very quickly working through this. Um, Kirsty, if you want to wrap it up for us in, in less than two minutes. Here we go. Um, um, so this slide pretty much was just kind of to wrap up and, and leave you with some thoughts to come back to us with feedback. Um, strategies to support the economic revival. We've been through the relief and stimulus packages. We've been through what everyone's collaborating on. So Town of Gawler, Gawler Business Development Group, RDA, Business Innovation Hub. So I'm sure your heads are swollen with all this new information um, and trying to connect the dots and how we can leverage everything that people are doing. Uh, we've got our infra infrastructure investment, um, both locally and regionally, to boost our economy as much as we can and fill that gap while the private sector is sort of trying to get back on its feet and happening. Government needs to step in and fill that gap with infrastructure investment and get things moving. Um, so if you would like to have some thoughts after tonight's workshop, um, looking at other, other examples of particular economic revival type strategies that you think are important in this, in this response, in this early stage, particularly of our um, economic development plan, you can email them directly to me, um, just giving us a few dot points or, or linking us to information or, or anything like that so, so that we can review it and look at how it might fit with the, um, with the recasting of the strategy. Okay, next steps, we, we're going to be um, doing
doing a, a lot of research around COVID-19, what's happening in other areas, what's happened before in scenarios like this. So back in the recession we had to have, you know, how did the recovery happen? How did it stage? What were the important things that really worked then that might help our, our business economy and, and our local governments now and our communities to come back together? And also um, we'll then sort of do a little bit of a rewrite of that plan We'll present it back to council to see your thoughts and have further input. Um, but we'll also in that in that space while we're while we're rewriting the plan, we'll be engaging with businesses, Gordon Business Development Group, RDA and BIH are, are both all working in with us as well. So there'll be a lot of discussion and collaboration going on there to to come back with that that next step of a plan for for further discussion. Okay, back to you, David. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Kirsty. Uh, really want to thank all of the elected members and our presenters tonight. It has been a very valuable discussion, I think, and gives us a really good opportunity to build that into this uh, recasting of the strategy and looking at it from that COVID-19 lens, ensuring that we have areas in each of the pillars that are immediate response as well as long term, because my sense of tonight's discussion was the pillars remain valid in an economic development strategy in the future. It's just how we deal with the uh, economic revival and recovery as a result of the pandemic within those pillars or an overarching leaf on top. So we'll mull over that as staff and work some magic into the recasting of the document and get it back through to you uh, when we can for further consideration and consultation. So thank you all very much for your time and look forward to connecting with you again tomorrow night. See you all then. <laughs>